Hi. 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 Mia. Uh, my audio. I'm going to pause the recording because we don't need to. Felice, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I am Felice Joyce. I am VP of Advocacy at SCJW. And I want to welcome everyone to our program today. But be we're going to begin by watching a YouTube, and then we're going to hear from our speaker, Judy Gladney. The name um, of the video we're going to see is by Design. First, I would like to briefly update you on some upcoming NCJW events, which may be of interest to you, and also some opportunities for action. But before I do that, I really want to give a shout out to NCJW for its instrumental effort in getting the Victims Employment Security and Safety Act, VESA, passed in Missouri. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Last week. Um, it's, it's taken about eight years of persistent support and testimony. And it shows that although it seems like forever, advocacy really does pay off. Advocacy is being in there for the long haul and it can really make change. If you're not familiar with the act, among other things that it provides, it provides unpaid leave time from work for victims of dom domestic and sexual violence. This means that these people who are often single parents or parents can take the time to seek legal counsel, show up in court, get counseling, and do all of these things without fear of losing their job. This is like very major. So we have to keep up our efforts. And now we have to contact Governor Parsons to insist that he uphold the will of Missouri voters and implement Medicaid expansion. You remember, we did pass the law. However, our lawmakers are choosing to not expand Medicaid coverage to working adult people by refusing to fund the health care program in our state budget. This is not acceptable and we must make a phone call. We also need you to tell your representative to endorse the American Families Plan that has been put forward by our president. Around 40% of women, many are women of color, had to leave the workforce as a result of COVID. This act would provide, among other things, paid family and medical leave, investments in childcare and education, and expanded nutrition assistance. This would be of great assistance to women, children, and families. Now, I think you've heard in the last week, the Supreme Court has decided to hear a case that is going to be very threatening to the decision in Roe v. Wade. And we need you to help put an end to the abortion ban coverage, also by reaching out to members of Congress and requesting that they support the EACH Act, which provides reproductive health and abortion care for many people. I'm saying this because we, were, we need your phone calls. These phone calls are doable and they do not take a long period of time. You need to find out who your representative is, get their phone number, know the name of the act. If you know the bill number, that's great. And all you have to do is call them and tell them you want them to either vote up or vote down. You give them your name and your district so that they know that your vote matters for them because you're either going to vote for them or against them. And that's all they care about, really. And half the time, they don't even know the name of the act because it's a legislative aid. But they'll write it down if you tell them. And you, and you are in and out in probably two to three minutes. And it really makes a big difference. Our next Lunch and Learn is going to be on June 17th. 
and the topic is Parenting a Transgender Child. Our speakers will be community volunteers, Lisa Brennan and Karen Rudolph and Rabbi Daniel Bogard. On a lighter note, you can tune into our next coffee talk on May 25th at 8.30 in the morning to hear Kalia Collier, who is a native St. Louisan and owner of the St. Louis Surge, a women's professional basketball team. And she's also VP of community relations with the St. Louis City Soccer Club. I have heard her speak. She's dynamic. You'll just, have, you'll just love it. Bring your coffee and tune in. And if you want to read more about this, um, these opportunities and others to get clicks, links, know the dates and the times, read our um, e-newsletter that comes out weekly, Five Ways to Advocate. If you don't already receive it and you would like to, contact Jen Bernstein. She's going to put her contact information in the chat and you will learn more. So now we're going to get ready to watch our video and um, just one or two words about it. I mean, have you noticed, I think we've all noticed just how segregated St. Louis is mm -hmm. and how our segregation, our segregation really mirrors where our wealth lies, where our political power lies, where our cultural experiences are, our health status, employment. Is it a coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. This feature is gonna show us just how results from intentional and unconstitutional governmental policies have impact how we live together and apart in our community. Jen, can you um, play this for our guests? I'm not hearing any audio. Is that just me? No, I don't, I don't hear it either. No. Did you set up audio in your share screen before you started to share? That's the mistake I've made a few times. What was that, Nancy? Bef when you when you first hit share screen and you mm -hmm. go to the screen that shows you all the different things that you could share, there's a, a spot along the bottom of that box or that screen that says enable video audio. Huh. Here, let me do it again then. Hmm. Share computer sound, would that be? Yep. Okay, let me start that over. I apologize, everyone. Easy mistake to make. I've certainly done it a few times. De facto segregation, by accident or the result of private prejudices. Yes, private prejudice clearly contributed to segregation, but by itself, it could not have segregated the country Can everyone without hear the now? intention of the federal government yes, to segregate thank you. neighborhoods throughout the nation. If, however, we understand the accurate history, the history that was once well known, but we've all now forgotten, that racially segregated patterns in every metropolitan area like St. Louis were created by de jure segregation. Racially explicit policy on the part of federal, state, and local governments designed to segregate metropolitan areas, then we can understand that we have an unconstitutional residential landscape. And if it's unconstitutional, then we have an obligation to remedy it. The federal government and the New Deal of the Roosevelt administration of the 1930s pursued policies in the mid-20th century that segregated metropolitan areas. One important policy was the first civilian public housing program, which frequently demolished integrated neighborhoods in order to create segregated public housing. In the late 1930s, another New Deal program, the United States Housing Authority, 
was adopted. The very first projects built under the United States Housing Authority authorization were in Austin, Texas, because the most aggressive proponent of public housing at that time was the congressman from Austin, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Johnson got the United States Housing Authority to put its first projects in Austin, separate projects for whites, for African Americans, and the project for Hispanics. The project for African Americans was placed in a location that the city plan of Austin had designated as a ghetto for African Americans. The United States Housing Authority and the local Austin Housing Authority demolished something called Emancipation Park which was a celebrations location for the abolition of slavery. The design was to move all African Americans in the city of Austin into this community, whether in public housing or in private housing. The city of Austin then began to close schools for African Americans elsewhere in the city, and close libraries and other public facilities to force African Americans to move to the east side. Another program that the federal government pursued to enforce segregation was the work of the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, which subsidized the development of suburbs like Levittown, New York, on condition that they only be sold to white families and that the homes in those suburbs had deeds that prohibited resale to African Americans. The Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual said that inharmonious racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities meaning that loans to African Americans could not be insured. Government at all levels throughout the nation were involved in promoting and enforcing the restrictive deeds in homes and places like Levittown, and judges enforced the view that these deeds did not violate the Constitution because they were private agreements. Although white middle-class families that moved into suburbs like Levittown could buy property with no down payments if they were veterans and low-interest mortgages, Middle-class African Americans had to make substantial down payments and get uninsured mortgages with higher interest rates. In many, if not most cases, African Americans could not get mortgages at all because the federal government would not insure them. As a result, they bought their homes on contract, like an installment plan where they accumulated no equity and could be evicted from their homes in the event of a single missed payment. Thus, contract buyers did not have the option of leaving a declining neighborhood before their properties were paid for in full. If they did, they would lose everything they'd invested in that property to date. The term redlining comes from the federal government's creation of maps of urban areas nationwide. And those maps were color-coded to indicate where it was safe to insure mortgages. Anywhere African Americans lived, even places where African Americans lived nearby, were colored red to indicate to appraisers that these neighborhoods were too risky for the FHA to insure. The FHA's justification was that if African Americans bought homes in white neighborhoods, or even if they bought homes near those neighborhoods, the property values of the homes they were insuring, the white homes they were insuring, would decline, and therefore their loans would be at risk. In 1940, for example, a Detroit builder was denied FHA insurance for a project that was near an African-American neighborhood. He then constructed a half-mile concrete wall, six feet high and a foot thick, separating the two neighborhoods, and then the FHA approved the loan. In the three decades during which it administered this policy, however, the agency never provided or obtained evidence to support its claim that integration undermined property values. In fact, often racial integration caused property values to increase because African Americans' housing supply was so restricted and they had so many fewer choices. If African Americans had access to housing throughout metropolitan areas, supply and demand balances would have kept their rents and home prices at reasonable levels. Without access, landlords and sellers were free to take advantage of the greater demand relative to supply for African American housing. A 1946 National Magazine article described the Chicago building where the landlord had divided a 540 square foot storefront into six cubicles, each housing a family. He had similarly subdivided the second story. Total monthly rent was as great as that generated by a luxury apartment on Chicago's Gold Coast along Lake Michigan. Such exploitation was possible only because public policy denied African Americans opportunities to participate in the city's white housing market. As the federal government concentrated low-income African Americans in single neighborhoods, 
The homes became overcrowded. Families had to subdivide their homes to make their mortgage payments or their property tax payments. Cities frequently withdrew public services from African-American neighborhoods. They collected garbage less frequently. They didn't provide water and sewer services. Polluting industry and toxic waste plants were placed in African-American communities in order to protect white neighborhoods from deterioration. The result was that African-American neighborhoods frequently turned into slums. White homeowners looked at these places and assumed that slum conditions were characteristics of African-Americans, not of government policy that forced this kind of overcrowding. White homeowners then became resistant to African-Americans moving into their neighborhoods because they thought they would bring slum conditions with them. Of course, the slums were not created by the people. They were created by the forced concentration, the overcrowding in these neighborhoods. Blockbusting was a scheme in which speculators bought properties in borderline black-white areas, rented or sold them to African-American families at above market prices, persuaded white families residing in these areas that their neighborhoods were turning into African-American slums and that values would soon fall precipitously, and then purchased the panicked white homes for less than their worth. Blockbuster's tactics included hiring African-American women to push carriages with their babies through white neighborhoods, hiring African-American men to drive cars with radios blasting through white neighborhoods, or making random telephone calls to residents of white neighborhoods and asking to speak to someone with a stereotypically African-American name, like Johnny May. State licensing agencies that regulated real estate agents could have easily stopped this practice. All they had to do was to lift the license of one or two real estate agents who engaged in these practices, and the practices would have ended. While many de jure segregation policies aim to keep African Americans far from white residential areas, public officials also shifted African American populations away from downtown business districts so that white commuters, shoppers, and business elites would not be exposed to black people. This was accomplished with slum clearance. One slum clearance tool was the construction of the federal interstate highway system. In many cases, state and local governments, with federal acquiescence, designed interstate highway routes to destroy urban African-American communities. In the 1950s, there was a white middle-class neighborhood in Los Angeles that wealthy African-Americans began to move into. It was called Sugar Hill. The first thing that happened was that the Neighborhood Association got together and tried to buy out the African-American families who were moving in, offering them more money than the African-Americans had paid in order to get them out of the neighborhood. When that didn't work, white homeowners tried to enforce a legal agreement prohibiting them from living in the neighborhood. And when that didn't work, the city council then decided it would be an African-American neighborhood. It rezoned it for multiple family housing. It eventually became a slum. And then the Santa Monica Freeway was built to clear that slum to destroy the neighborhood. So these policies all worked together in an unconstitutional fashion to segregate Los Angeles. In 1957, Bill and Daisy Myers were able to purchase a home in Levittown, Pennsylvania, the Levitt Company's second large development. When the mail carrier discovered that he was delivering mail to an African-American family, he let everyone in the neighborhood know, and as many as 600 white demonstrators soon showed up in front of the Myers' house, pelting the family and their home with rocks. Law enforcement stood by as this happened. For two months, rocks were thrown, crosses were burned, the Ku Klux Klan symbol was painted on the wall next door. Some policemen stood with the mob, joking and encouraging its participants. One sergeant was actually demoted to patrolman because he objected to orders he had been given not to interfere with the rioters. In 1951, World War II veteran Harvey Clark, his wife Janetta, and two small children rented an apartment in Old White Cicero, a suburb of Chicago. When the Clarks refused to leave, a mob of 4,000 rioted, raiding the apartment, destroying the fixtures, and throwing the family's belongings out the window onto the lawn where they were set ablaze. Time magazine reported that the police officers present, quote, acted like ushers politely handling the overflow of the football stadium, unquote. The only people that the grand jury indicted were Harvey Clark, his real estate agent, his NAACP attorney, and the white landlady who rented the apartment to him, as well as her attorney, on charges of inciting a riot and conspiring to lower property values. Stories like this were commonplace. 
and state-sponsored violence was a means, along with many others, by which all levels of government maintained segregation. Today, African-American incomes are about 60% of white incomes. But African-American wealth is about 10% of white wealth. Most middle-class families in this country gain their wealth from the equity they have in their homes. So this enormous difference between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is almost entirely attributable to federal housing policy implemented through the 20th century. African-American families that were prohibited from buying homes in the suburbs in the 1940s and 50s and even into the 60s by the Federal Housing Administration gained none of the equity appreciation that whites gained. Across the country in new developments, these homes in the late 1940s and 1950s sold for about twice national median income. They were affordable to working class families with an FHA or VA mortgage. African Americans were equally able to afford those homes as whites, but were prohibited from buying them. Today, those well. homes sell for $300,000 to $400,000 at the minimum, six to eight times national median income. The white families sent their children to college with the wealth they gained from appreciating home equity. They were able to take care of their parents in old age and not depend on their children. They were able to bequeath wealth to their children. None of those advantages accrued to African Americans, who for the most part were prohibited from buying homes in those suburbs. So in 1968, we passed the Fair Housing Act that said, in effect, okay, African Americans, you're now free to buy homes in the suburbs that had been forbidden. But it's an empty promise, because those homes are no longer affordable to the families whose parents or grandparents could have afforded them when whites were buying into those suburbs and gaining the equity and wealth that followed from their purchases. Consider children who come from families where they're economically stressed, or in poor health because they have no access to good health care, or because they live in polluted environments. When they do come to school, for example, they may suffer from asthma because of that pollution and are drowsy from being awake at night wheezing. They cannot then typically achieve at levels of children who come to school well rested. When you concentrate children like that in single classrooms, it's impossible for teachers to develop the kind of outcomes that they can in middle class children who come to school healthy, unstressed, and able to pay attention to schooling. What economists know is that African-American children from low-income families who grow up in segregated neighborhoods are less likely as adults to move into the middle class than are African-American children whose families have the same low incomes but who live in integrated neighborhoods. So segregation itself impedes intergenerational mobility and perpetuates, rigidifies the inequality that we experience. Another thing that social psychologists have discovered is that decision-making is hampered when you don't have diverse decision-making groups. These psychologists have done experiments where they put people together to solve problems in both diverse groups and in segregated groups. And the diverse groups are much better able to solve problems because they challenge assumptions much more than the segregated groups do. So segregation impedes our political and economic success. We have three provisions in the federal constitution that prohibit the kinds of actions that federal, state, and local governments pursued to create residential segregation. One is the Fifth Amendment, which requires the federal government to treat all citizens fairly. Another is the 14th Amendment, that requires state and local governments not only to treat citizens fairly, but to treat them equally. And then the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, also requires that we banish the effects of slavery, which Congress long ago determined was any form of second-class citizenship. So in fact, the prohibition on African Americans to purchase homes in federally subsidized white communities or the segregation of public housing created a form of second-class citizenship, which was a violation of the 13th Amendment. We cannot reverse the jury segregation mainly with lawsuits. We must also build a national political consensus leading to legislation, a challenging but not impossible task. Our focus now should be to develop policies that promote an integrated society, understanding it will be impossible to fully untangle the web of unconstitutional inequality that we've woven. 
To begin, we should first contemplate what we have collectively done and, on behalf of our government, accept responsibility to fix it. Well, that was a really powerful video with a lot of information to digest. And I would heartily recommend people reading Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Um, now we're gonna hear from our speaker, Judy Gladney, uh, who will talk about her personal experiences growing up in St. Louis. Judy Gladney is a lifelong civil rights activist and raised by a family deeply involved in the civil rights movement. Her father marched with Martin Luther King. Judy moved to St. Louis during her childhood years and lived in North St. Louis and later University City, which were predominantly white communities at that time. She began school as being the only black child in her class and ended up being um, predominantly surrounded by black children upon graduation. She attended, she spent most of her, she attended Howard University and graduated from Washington University in 1974. Her first job was for the Urban League. For many years, she worked in the healthcare area, owned a home health agency and worked for St. Louis University in an administrative capacity. She was married to Eric Vickers, a well-known attorney and civil rights activist here in St. Louis. Currently, Judy is the court clerk to the Honorable Judy Draper, a municipal judge in Bell Fountain. In her spare time, she mentors college students at Harris Stowe College. Judy? Thanks so much for the introduction, Felice. I'm gonna uh, reiterate a few things. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm a product of parents born during the depression, during Jim Crow South. I was born in 1952 and didn't experience the horrors of Southern racism that my parents did. But I did grow up in the 50s and 60s and 70s and those decades were fraught with racial strife and an awakened sense of what social just, justice should be in these United States of America. As Felice mentioned, I um, graduated from Washington University and I married my, high, my college sweetheart, Aaron Vickers, who later became a civil rights activist. Uh, I did come to uh, St. Louis in the 1950s, started living in what was called the Ville neighborhood, a very strong black neighborhood in North St. Louis. Our home was right down the street from Homer Phillips Hospital, which was a great training center for black physicians, not only African-American physicians, but physicians of color throughout the United States. I say all this to say that even though I was young, I didn't realize I was growing up in segregated circumstances. That's just the, light, the, way, the, the way life was. Uh, I was surrounded by black people. We rented from a black physician when I lived in the Ville. And after a year of living in St. Louis, my parents bought a home in North St. Louis, a working class community. We really didn't have any difficulties moving into a working class white community. Uh, as Felice mentioned, I was the only black student in my first grade class. But by the time I graduated at that time, I went to Ashland Elementary School in North St. Louis. Ashland <clears throat> went from kindergarten until eighth grade and poor Larry Fitzgerald, I'll never forget his name, was the only white student in my class in eighth grade. So in the period from first grade to eighth grade, the neighborhood completely flipped and transitioned from an integrated community uh, with a sprinkling of black students to a completely black school. I shouldn't say completely, but prim primarily black school. 
Um, I say all that to say what's interesting is housing is just part of the problem. When I entered Ashland, um, it housed the gifted program for, for gifted students. When the racial demographics changed in the community, they yanked the gifted program out of Ashland and moved it to a white elementary school, Walnut Park. Ironically, now Walnut Park is predominantly, predominantly black and there's a lot of crime in that neighborhood. But what's so frustrating is that whether it's housing or whether it's education, Blacks are systemically kept out of better housing, better schools, and that trickles down on so many levels and hurts not only our community, but in my mind, our country as a whole. Um, My real story begins interacting with the Jewish community in 1966, when we moved from North St. Louis to the University City Hills. I didn't realize it at the time, but the University City Hills was a gated community. No blacks had ever lived there until my family moved to University City Hills. Really interesting, my father was a physician he practiced a Jewish hospital, and one of his colleagues who knew that he was house hunting mentioned that there was a house um, on Teesdale Avenue in the hills that was up for sale. It was a one owner home. The husband had recently passed away and the wife wanted to sell the home. Uh, my father knocked on the door one Sunday uh, morning introduced himself, expressed his interest to, to purchase the home. How this white woman in her 80s allowed him to come into her house, view the house, I don't know. It, I just call it an act of God. But he viewed the house, he fell in love with the house and the homeowner, um, likewise, it was mutually um, admiration. And she agreed, uh, verbally agreed to sell the home to my family. The next day, the owner mentioned to my um, mentioned to her realtor that she had met this nice physician, and she had agreed verbally to sell the house to him. The realtor was horrified and said there was no way he would execute a contract with the black family. Well, the realtor had no idea who he was dealing with, and the homeowner allowed the real estate contract to expire so that she could sell the home directly to our family. That's the only way we were able to get the house in University City. What we later found out after we moved in is that the community got together, the University City Hills community got together and sort of was saying, who are these folks? You know, basically who are these black folks moving gated community? We really didn't have any real difficulties living there other than the fact that there was one neighbor who never talked to us. Um, and was very uh, obvious that she was upset that there was a black family living across the street from her. That was my experience, not really a negative experience, but my personal experience. However, my former husband, Eric Vickers, also moved into University City in 1967. His experience was very different. He moved from East St. Louis. His father was a principal. Uh, they saved their money. They were able to get a house in University City. And the move-in date, they found that black paint had been splattered across their front door. That was their wel welcoming to their community. Uh, so his experience was very different. He later became a civil rights activist and I really believe that move-in experience sort of sparked something in his, in his spirit that he wanted to right some of the injustices that we as a people experienced. Um, there are other people that I know that experience pushback when trying to move into white neighborhoods. My father's best friend was Frank Richards, who was a surgeon. He moved on to, uh, he viewed a house on Teesdale Court 
his wife was a board member of some organization. I'm not sure what organization. And they attempted to get financing for the house that their friends were willing, were going to sell. Even though he was a physician, an acclaimed surgeon, he could not get financing to move into University City on Teasdale Court. So their friends, the homeowners, actually personally financed the home and he paid his mortgage payments directly to the prior homeowners. My father had another friend, Sydney Smith, an internist whose wife was extremely fair. She was black, but a lot of folks didn't realize it. She came from a wealthy family in Memphis. She also was a stockbroker. So she viewed the home also in University City Hills and worked out the real estate purchase without the homeowners or real estate agent even realizing they had done a transaction with a, white, with a black person. This happened quite a bit where black folks who had a certain type of complexion would pass as whites to accomplish certain goals. Um, there's a, a recent case uh, that has come to the attention of uh, the St. Louis community, and that is of Dr. Howard Venable. He was an ophthalmologist who purchased two lots in Creve Coeur, uh, built a home in Creve Coeur uh, off of Spady Road, and the mayor of Creve Coeur at the time in 1956 was like, oh no, this is not gonna happen in Creve Coeur. We are not gonna have a whole bunch of black folks moving into here. There were other black people that had interested in buying property uh, around where the Venables purchased their home, which is uh, called Spady Meadows subdivision. And they were convinced not to buy property. Dr. Venable had a strong personality as well as his wife, Katie, and he was like, no, you're not gonna uh, prevent me from li living on this property that I bought. So then Mayor Bernie uh, enacted eminent O domain and pushed them out of their home. Uh, they later moved further west um, in West County. I'm not sure exactly where their other house was, but the property that they owned in, in um, Spady Meadows then became Bernie Park. This is uh, a real estate deal that has come to the attention recently of the media. I'm not sure what the standing is now, but there's a movement to change the name from Bernie Park to Venable Park in it, honor of Dr. Venable. It has been changed. It has been changed. Okay, thank you. There, thank you for that. Uh, there were other Black folks, uh, I don't have the name of a couple in California, but they had property uh, on Malibu Beach. Uh, and again, eminent domain moved them out of that property and their family also was embroiled in a lawsuit in recent years. And they did get a favorable ruling and are gonna get a multi-million dollar settlement. But there's just a history of Blacks whether they had the mean, financial means or not of being having unusual challenges of trying to get better education and better housing for their family. One of my best friends growing up was Robert Wilson. His mother was attorney Margaret Bush, Bush Wilson, also a civil rights attorney who was the first president, black female president of the NACP. Her father, James Bush, was a prominent St. Louis real estate broker who was frustrated in the 40s of Blacks getting homes financed by banks. And in the video we just mentioned, uh, saw it, contract financing was mentioned where Black families would pay to the banks but wouldn't have equity. And then eventually if they missed even one payment, the property would be confiscated and go back to the bank. Mr. Bush, Margaret Bush Wilson's father, was so frustrated with this practice that he went to Denver, Colorado 
and appealed to a civil organization that was composed of very prominent and wealthy black businessmen. It was called the Woodsman's Club. And he got a $100,000 loan in the 1940s. He came back to St. Louis and he made personal loans to black people in order to um, stop this practice of contract lending where black families would invest in a home and then that home would be um, taken over by the bank. As part of his effort to further black home ownership in St. Louis, he was behind, he's not a well-known name. You don't find it in the um, in Google when you Google or whatever, but he was behind the Shelley versus Kramer Supreme Court decision, which ruled uh, that blacks were allowed to purchase homes in previously um, white only neighborhoods to help remedy housing segregation. And a few years back, the St. Louis, um, I'm sorry, the museum, the uh, Missouri Historical Society had an exhibit called Blacks, uh, I'm sorry, called St. Louis, number one in civil rights. And there were several cases that mentioned housing legislation um, that reversed the discriminatory, discriminatory practices that had heretofore been in effect. Um, one person making a difference, Howard Venable made a difference, um, and Kay Dry, I'm not sure if you all know who Kay Dry is, but she's a force of nature, a Jewish woman whose husband, uh, Leo Dry, at one time was the largest landowner in Missouri. She lived in University City. I think she still lives in University City for many years. And when in the 60s, Black people were first starting to move into University City, she and her husband bought, I'm not sure how many homes north of Olive, because what they saw was the realtors were trying to, what they call bust the communities where they go in and they scare the current owners and say, the black folks are coming. We were, black folks are coming. And, and, and that's the polite way of saying maybe what they said using the N word. Uh, so Kay Dry wanted to make sure that property, that whole neighborhoods didn't flip from black to the white uh, because of these unethical real estate practices. And for a time that worked, U City remained integrated. But now that is not the case. Even though there's large home ownership of whites in U City, predominantly um, the school system, I think is 80 or more percent black. There's so much that needs to be done. And I mentioned Cable Dry to say one person can make a difference. This organization can make a difference. Advocacy is at the heart of change. Uh, many times it does take years, uh, but it's worth the effort. And I commend you all for having me, for showing um, the video at the beginning of the program and for opening the dialogue of how we can right some of the wrongs of the past and move forward. I'm not going to get into politics too much, but we are in a situation of trying to recover from an, a presidential administration that harbored and fostered division. And I commend this organization, the National Council of Jewish Women, for doing whatever you can to help healing and understanding that is so much needed in the land. If there's anything you want to ask me about, um, please do. Those were my personal experiences. There's so many um, other experiences. Like I said, I, I, I had difficulties of a, a minor matter, but there were people whose homes were bombed or burned down or whatever. Like the first day they showed up on a property that they had purchased, mobs gathered and destroyed the property. 
Malcolm X became radicalized, radicalized because he moved into a community and the Klan set up a, a cross and burned a cross. And his mother became insane, mentally insane after that and suffered from mental health issues after that. So, you know, my experience, yes, I experienced discrimination, but it's so much deeper than what my family experienced. And it's something that we all have to work to eradicate. What I've said in the past is Black folks have always understood that there were the disparities. Just living in this country, we had to navigate two worlds. Now I feel it is a problem that white folks, Jewish folks, the majority population has to figure out strategies and methods to right the wrongs. And again, I can't thank you enough for having me starting the discussion and working to form a better world. Thank you, Judy, that was, that was excellent. And it's always powerful to hear someone's personal experiences. Um, if you have questions, you can uh, type them in the chat. Marlene, would you like to say what you wrote um, there? Marlene Hammerman, otherwise I'll read it. I have to unmute. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, hi, Judy. I graduated U City with you in uh, 69. And I thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your, your knowledge uh, with us. And I just want to talk, I, I mean, I witnessed as a young white Jewish woman, the white flight that occurred in U City at the end of my high school years. It was it was really frightening to see everyone put up a for sale sign and just move out to Ladue Parkway, kind of you know running running away and selling their houses um, in mass and mass. Uh, I'm proud to say my parents did not move and stayed there. Um, and uh, actually, my house on 82nd Street looks more well kept and nicer than it did when my parents <laughs> lived there. So uh, it's, it's interesting. And thank you for making us just more aware and hopefully better advocates for social justice and equality. Thank you. I really appreciate those com uh, comments. And uh, it, it takes a village. It takes us working together. Uh, I'm just thankful that there's another level of awakening. For so many years, people thought that we were exaggerating the problems in the Black community. We have not. It's time now for solutions. And uh, again, I thank this organization for being solution-minded. Uh, Nancy, um Nix Rice wrote that uh, she highly recommended the white paper, The Making of Ferguson by the same author as the video. And it is a St. Louis specific uh, video and a look at these same issues and you can Google it and download it for free. Yeah, okay. So, any other questions? I have a comment, a friend of mine that's an author author Vivian Gibson has written her personal experience of living in the Ville, which was a strong black neighborhood. Um, and Highway 40 slash 64 destroyed the Ville neighborhood. So not only did they displace black families, but cultures, uh, black culture was disrupted. And uh, it's, it's a great read. It's available at West Bank Books and probably many other places online. But it's a great read about her personal experience growing up in the Ville and how um, urban so-called revitalization changed her whole world. I just uh, read in um, a book, Untamed, something that made me think about this. It says, she said, privilege is being born on third base. Ignorant privilege is thinking you're there because you hit a triple. And malicious privilege is complaining that those starving outside the ballpark aren't waiting patiently enough. Yeah. So this knowledge is important 
to go forward. Most definitely. Uh, Felice is asking. Linda, what was the source of that? It was that, the that book is, that was so powerful. The book is Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Um, Thank you. And Vivian Gibson, Jen just wrote Vivian Gibson, um, the book about the um, the bill and how the highway disrupted that neighborhood and culture. That's that's um, just the, the book that Judy had just recommended. Yeah. I was just writing it down so people could oh, see. Oh, okay. I am um, and Felice wanted to know, she was curious what people think we should be doing to go forward to change the way our communities areas are um, formed here, our community areas. I have a comment. When Felice and I were talking, I was talking about uh, racism is, to me, based on fear. Uh, and if your only exposure to people of another race is based on media portrayals, uh, you have an unrealistic um, understanding of what that race is about. For instance, one of my favorite phrases is black is not a monolithic entity. We're not all have drugs or um, poverty or many of the ills that you see on television or in the media. Um, and I used to belong to a church called Pilgrim Congregational, which then became Pilgrim United Church of Christ. And we used to have a move, movable feast. And I think that's a great way of inviting people into your home, seeing how people of another race or religion live. Uh, the feast would start at one home for an appetizer, go to another home for an entree, another home for the dessert or whatever. Um, and when you actually go into someone's home and break bread, that, that's a whole another level of understanding or appreciation. That's a small way of, of breaking down barriers and, and facilitating understanding. There are other organizations that are working on behalf of social justice and raising consciousness. And I'll try and get to Felice some of those. I know Christy Griffin uh, has worked um, with Bernice Young, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, not, I mean, Bernice King, Martin Luther King's youngest daughter, dealing with the racial justice issues. And uh, she's part of the ethics project. But there are lots of organizations to get plugged into. And again, I commend the Nas National Council of Jewish Women for taking a stand and trying to make a difference. Thank you. Um, Nina, could you unmute and tell me, I'm not familiar with the new Mills Creek lofts and what you were saying about it. Okay, I heard a presentation yesterday at a Sheldon board meeting. Uh, there's a, a developer, so St. Louis University has bought a lot of property. Um, some is by the new soccer stadium and some sort of uh, parts of downtown. And there's a whole bunch of developments going up, apartments, uh, some uh, houses, some, uh, there's a new hotel on Forest Park yeah. Avenue. Um, you know, apparently many of them are vacant properties. Um, and um, it's, it's, it, it's funny because well, I have a degree in urban planning, which I never got to use. And I, you know, it's been sort of horrifying for me to learn through Broken Heart of America and CAST and a lot of things that I've been reading, what real urban planning was, was, was terrible. And mm -hmm. uh, um, anyway, so uh, Mill Creek, it was uh, a, ver a very prosperous black community mm -hmm. kind of in the middle, I want to say Union Station-ish. And there was residential and business and it was cleared out in the name of urban planning and renovation mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. and I was just horrified to hear that there's a new property that's being called Mill Creek Lofts and 
you know, they're putting a sculpture out front to honor the neighborhood that was there. I mean, to me, it's an insult. Mm -hmm. I just, I sent a note to Tony Messenger and said, why isn't anybody in the media talking about this? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it just sort of seems endemic of the problem. It's sort of just like the Confederate statue problem that you don't, mm -hmm. you don't honor a horrible thing that happened. Right, right. So, I don't know. Uh, Stacy um, Barton put a, um, a link on um, the chat to see the, um, for the St. Louis Public Radio, um, about Mill Creek. Oh, good. And, um, uh, yeah, it, about a, the story, a, the history, the history of Mill Creek, it looks good. like. Good. Yeah, and as an aside, um, one thing that I found helpful is that the St. Louis American newspaper is a really well written publication. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. can sign up and get emails from them a couple times a week on uh, different, you know, things or even just go and look on their website. I mean, I think our local newspaper doesn't cover uh, African American issues and history and people so much. And uh, I guess I would recommend that people look at that. Thank you. But yeah, thanks for this link. I know there was a there was a book about the children of Mill Creek and the I See Me bookstore, I think had an interview with the author recently. That's the book I was referring to by Vivian Gibson. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So was the so was Mill Creek what uh, part of Deville? I believe so. I believe so. I'm not real good with the boundaries of like the Mill Creek and um, different communities, but the current Ville is further north, like what's considered the Ville, and then there's Greater Ville. It's by Jeff Vanderloo if that helps people at all, it's up by Fairground Park. So that's a community huh. we do a lot of work in. Okay, thanks. And, and there's a very thriving, Stone. thriving community in the Ville and a lot of, of efforts to provide services and, and neighborhood um, connections. So there's, there's good stuff going on, um, just not necessarily um, super public, like not on, on everybody's radar. Yeah, I think it would probably help our group to know more about volunteer opportunities in some neighborhoods or ways that we could uh, help more. I mean, I know I connected a little bit with a group called Link STL in Hyde Park um, that is trying to develop the community and um, we have a Halloween party every year and had to teach the kids how to trick or treat because it wasn't safe enough. A lot of the kids didn't know their neighbors. Um, but I think a lot of us tend to, that grew up in West County, tend to stay in a five mile radius and don't venture out much. So uh, we, we need more introductions to people and places in North County and North City and uh, organizations where we can uh, make a difference and help. There's an organization in um, Dutchtown called Interstellar Arts. And um, what they are trying to do, and this um, illustrates a point um, that Judy made about people getting to know each other. They rent out artist lofts um, to art students and artists, and, but they also have uh, space for kids in the neighborhood. And it's an integrated neighborhood where kids can come and they could, um, into like a soundproof making music or do dance and they have all sorts of, um, they have an art gallery there and they were planning on having meals. Um, I think there were four or five times a year, certain amounts, uh, there was a certain set aside where some of them were free so the homeless people could come and there was a sliding scale and it was a four course gourmet dinner. Uh, sometimes uh, the, performances were classical musicians or artists, and they were having dinner and having conversations with people that chose to attend. 
and it was an integrated community and just sitting down and getting to know people and spending an evening together in a lovely environment with good food and good art and music um, surrounding you. And so that would be an organization to check out. I know that they got delayed a little bit during the COVID time, but I, I think I read something that they're reopening and going forward with that. Uh, we're running out of time here. So, um, I, you know, I'd like to continue this conversation, but I want to respect everyone's time. And Judy, thank you so much for your presentation and your generosity and graciousness to take time from work to um, be part of our community and share your experiences with us. We're going to be sending an evaluation out, right, Jen? Um, <laughs> after this, I always forget to mention this. And um, we hope that you would fill it out because it really helps us in going forward with our programming um, so that we know what other kinds of programs to create and information that we can share with our community. And I wanna just thank everyone for attending and uh, see you next month. Again, we're the third Thursday of the month from 12 to one. Thank you. You're, thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.